Uh, so glad to see you all this morning. Uh, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> uh, when we were together last, we saw the danger of philosophy and the deity of Christ from Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 through 10. And specifically in verse 10, we saw that we have been filled in Christ. And we said that basically means that we are complete in Christ. And then in today's text, which is Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, if you have your Bibles, Paul elaborates on that completeness. And he's going to show us today that in Christ, our salvation is complete, very important. Our forgiveness is complete, and our victory is complete. Such a powerful text. It's Colossians chapter 2. Verses 11 through 15, if you're there, follow along as I read. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Let's pray. Now, Father, it's an incredibly difficult passage, but it's an incredibly amazing passage. Father, it's my prayer that even in the midst of uh, all of my noticeable imperfections, you'll use me today uh, to explain what you're saying to us here. Father, it's my prayer that uh, we won't simply hear the explanation But it's my prayer that we'll apply this explanation to our lives. So, Father, I pray that you'll give me uh, the ability to say what I need to say. And, Father, even if that's not the case this morning, if that's not possible this morning, it's my prayer that uh, your Holy Spirit will intercept my words so that this message will penetrate hearts. Father, you have uh, the amazing ability to say what needs to be said to lost and empty hearts. And it's my prayer today that you'll speak to an empty heart. And I pray that you'll fill them with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you'll draw them now. Draw them to yourself now. Give give someone an opportunity today to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I realize that we have Labor Day, and I realize that we have cookouts, and I realize that we have college football, and I realize that we have COVID, but then there's Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you'll help us to be sure that Jesus is always at the top of that list. And, Father, I pray, oh, God, I pray for your help in these next few minutes because you know I need it. It's in Christ's name that I pray. It's by his spirit that we live. Amen. All right. So I want you to notice with me, first of all, as I've already said, uh, but the Apostle Paul shows us very clearly that in Christ, okay, our salvation is complete. And since the text is so short, let me read it again. Verses 11 and 12, In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, it it seems to me that the metaphorical use of circumcision is referring here to the crucifixion of Christ. Okay, and we know, by the way, that, that its use is metaphorical because the text says it's a circumcision made without hands. And so if you circumcise without hands, right, without getting graphic, 
It has to be metaphorical. And the reason I believe this circumcision refers to the crucifixion, listen very carefully, is because the words putting off the body of flesh seem to be pointing to the violent and even gruesome reality of Jesus' death by crucifixion. The words, in other words, were meant to give us a mental picture of a horribly painful death. That seems to be where the New American Bible, New American Standard Bible translators were headed with their interpretation when they chose this phrase, the removal of the body of the flesh. So if you remove the body of flesh, right, you die. And so that's the reason I believe this is speaking to the crucifixion of Christ and not to the circumcision of our heart, okay? So there are sort of different ways that commentators have seen that over the last four, five, six hundred years. But I believe the reality of crucifixion here is being used in, the, excuse me, circumcision is being used in the sense of the, of the crucifixion of Christ. It's very important for the interpretation uh, of this passage. But I want you to note also that uh, Paul places us with Christ in his crucifixion right I I hope you saw that the text says in him in Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands so Paul is pointing to our incorporation into Christ Paul is pointing to our union with Christ so when Johnny Cash sings the old African-American spiritual were you there when they crucified my Lord Right? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? We can say yes, based on Colossians 2, 11. So the metaphorical use of the word circumcision is pointing to the crucifixion of Christ. And if the believers at Colossae were circumcised in Christ's circumcision, that is, they died in his death, then it immediately follows and it just makes sense that they were, so says the text, buried with him in baptism. Right? So they died with Christ. They were buried in baptism with Christ it's pointing again to our incorporation into Christ to our union with Christ a real death right occurred for Christ I mean Christ absolutely died a real death occurred for us the medical metaphorical use of the word baptism then points to the reality that just as Christ was buried and raised we too have been buried and raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God and that means that we now walk or live as Paul says in Romans 6 4 in newness of life And it means that, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. (laughs) So we are no longer the same person we once were if we're truly in Christ. And the way that we're truly in Christ is, is by responding to the drawing power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have anything to do with chill bumps. It doesn't have anything to do with with an overly emotional experience. It has everything to do with you hearing from God deep down in your soul and then you responding to God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the important thing to note here is the old is gone. Now it doesn't mean that we won't still wage war against the flesh. Even the Apostle Paul waged war against his own flesh in Romans 7. And Paul would see himself oftentimes doing the very thing that he knew he shouldn't do. And he would long to do the right thing. But sometimes he just did the wrong thing. And that's the battle that still takes place. But the reality is, if you're sitting up in here today and you are in Christ and you act just as crazy as you did before you knew Christ constantly, consistently, there's a problem. Okay? Okay? There's a, there's a daggum problem, and you need to figure out what that problem is. There is no way that you can be the same today if you've really taken in the fact that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross at Calvary, and he bled out for you so that you could live the kind of life that he wants you to live. It's the abundant life. 
And if you're constantly going back to your vomit over and over and over again, well then, Houston, we have a problem. And there's no reason in acting like you don't. Because I don't know if you understand this or not. But there are wars. There are rumors of wars. There are diseases. There are earthquakes. There are natural disasters. There are problems all over the world. So Jesus is really close to coming back. (laughs) He's a lot closer today than he was yesterday. And so why live like hell while you're acting like a saint. Friends, it's time to come to faith in Jesus. If you're sitting up in here and you're Baptist by osmosis, you're going to hell. You cannot go to heaven just because you've attended a worship service. The only way you can go to glory is to be absolutely transformed from the inside out. And you want to know how you know when that happens? God's Spirit testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. Your wife ain't got to tell you. Your preacher ain't got to tell you. Your mama ain't got to tell you. God's Spirit tells you on the inside of you that you're going to glory one day. That's exactly where Paul is headed in this text. I have been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Don't miss the one doing the work. Paul says it's the powerful, the energia. It's where we get our word energy. It's the powerful working of God. So when we continue to sing with Johnny Catch, which is always a good idea, were you there when the stone was rolled away? Were you there when the stone was rolled away? Sometimes it causes me to tremble. Some of us never tremble, though, Johnny. Right? What does Johnny mean there? What, what, did, what did the original writer of that song mean? I'm going to tell you something, man. I tremble when I think about the reality of what Christ did for somebody as low down and sorry as I am. Some of y'all know how sorry I am. And Christ died for me. Were you there when the stone was rolled away? We can say yes (laughs) based on Colossians 2 and verse 12. Yes. So in these two verses, I hope you notice this, we have the full gospel shown to us. And in case you've forgotten, Paul tells us exactly what the full gospel is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So all three of those elements Death, burial, and resurrection are found in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. Only this time, Paul is showing us how we are incorporated into Christ. How we are literally in Christ Jesus. Thus proving beyond any shadow of a doubt that our salvation is complete. In him. Next, Paul shows us that in Christ our forgiveness is complete. Look at verses 13 and 14. Uh, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside nailing it to the cross. Perhaps there's not a greater reality in all of the scriptures than this. We have been forgiven. And friends, we have been completely forgiven in Christ. This is a point that sometimes gets mispreached. All the sins that we have committed, that we are committing, and that we will commit have been completely forgiven. So I've heard this ridiculous scenario. If you're going down the road, a real scenario from a person who really believes this, and someone pulls out in front of you and you cuss them out, and you die without having an opportunity 
to repent of cussing the dude out for killing you, you're going to hell because you sinned in your last breath. Not based on what Paul says. That's some dumb, but man-made tradition. Do you understand? Forgiveness is complete. Forgiveness is complete. Now, you need to ask God to forgive you daily, but there is no reason for you to be scared if you decide to go bungee jump, and the last thing that you say is, oh, blank, whenever the cord breaks and you hit the ground, because if you are truly in Christ, he's taking care of you. Can anybody say amen to that? Or have we fallen trapped to believing that the, the, the reality is if we say something crazy now or if we act crazy now, we're just going to lose what God has done for us in Christ because that's exactly what you're saying. The reality is the whole deal of forgiveness lies in the hands of Jesus and forget not that he bled in those hands for you. And so the apostle Paul is making so much sense here. It makes me wonder sometimes why we even need a preacher. Because he's just preaching the text. But notice, right? This forgiveness was not the story for the Colossians before the powerful working of God. Right? Not everyone is saved right now. Not everyone will be saved. The apostle says... That they were dead in their trespasses and the uncircumcision of their flesh. They were outside of the covenant. They had no hope. They were spiritually dead. Anybody want to guess as to what it means to be dead? Dead. (laughs) It's not a trick question. If you're physically dead, you cannot respond to someone talking to you. Can we all agree on that fact before I move any further? Sort of. (laughs) If you're dead, can you walk? I'm not talking about the instances in the Bible where dead people have walked. (laughs) A spiritually dead person can also not respond to any spiritual stimuli on their own because they're dead God has to awaken you I mean people don't like to hear that people want to say no I got up this morning I brushed my teeth I put on my church clothes I sat in my car on the way to church while I was listening to Johnny Cash that I'm getting saved today, having never heard from God. You come in, you come down, you make the wife happy, you get saved, and you go on and live like hell for the rest of your life. You are not saved. <laughs> you understand God initiates the salvific process. You don't. You don't. And God tries to prick our, God does prick our spirit through the preaching of the gospel. And once he finally gets it there, he begins to open it up so that we can see we really need Jesus. And then he gives us the gift of belief. And then we believe. Paul's all over that in Ephesians chapter 2, in Romans chapter 8, in Galatians chapter 3, all over the Bible. And so the reality is we're dead until God awakens us. And God's trying to get some of you folks to wake up today, not physically. (laughs) Although I see some folks sleeping. He's trying to get you to wake up spiritually. And the preacher preaches and he preaches and he preaches. And your friends, they minister and they minister and they minister. And your neighbor preaches and preaches and preaches. And you hear Billy Graham and you hear Franklin Graham and you hear John Piper and you hear all these other people accidentally and your ears are closed why is that because you're being led by Satan so the reality is we got to get up out of ourselves and we got to get up out of the world and we got to get up out of the flesh and we got to open our eyes and see that God is calling all men to himself but the reality is not everyone will be saved because everyone without exception loves their sin at some point in their lives and some of us unfortunately won't grow up and get out of that sin and say yes to the king 
not very nice way to put it. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry, okay? And I'm going to tell you something. You're living in the deep south and haven't responded to the gospel. I hate to see it for you on Judgment Day. God help us. How many bad sermons have y'all had to listen to since I've been here? A bunch of them. There's still somebody sitting here putting it off. I ain't finna get saved. There's still somebody sitting here. I got baptized in 1970. There's still somebody sitting here. I got sprinkled back in the 40s. There's still somebody sitting up in here saying, I am a member at this church. And yet, you're probably lost as a goose. Wouldn't know Jesus Christ if he walked down this aisle, bloodied up, carrying his cross, coming to the front to say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Friends, it is time for us to stop playing games, and it's time for us to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's done absolutely everything for us. Everything has been done for us. The only thing we have to do is receive it. It's like a kid on Christmas morning. Just receive the gift that God is offering you today. Don't put it off any longer. Don't wait for a better preacher. You might not get a better preacher. You might be stuck with me forever. So the reality is, come to faith in Christ before. Am I begging you? Yes! It goes against my nature. I don't think emotionalism gets anybody into heaven. I don't even know that passionate preaching gets anybody into heaven. But I want you to understand now, I know I have friends that are about to bust hell wide open. I mean, if you don't die from COVID, you might die from something else. And I just want folks to understand, God is getting his church gathered up now. He's calling his church now in the midst of all of the chaos you see going on. So don't let the chaos divert you. Don't let it drive you away from church. Don't let it cause you to say, everything else in my life is more important than coming up here and listening to this loudmouth preacher. The reality is the most important thing in your life is to say yes to Jesus Christ and then live like the new person that he's created you to be. Okay? So now don't get paid extra for yelling and getting I'm so worried at the numbers 40 years. Hey, and this number I don't know if Market Cafe is open on Sunday or not. I always say Mexican. I was trying to think of something different. Lake Ticotta is open on Sunday. And have a meal over me and talk about how ugly I was. Hey, look, I'm going to tell, tell you something. I, I was the most hard-headed, uh, fake Christian that God has ever seen. And he saved me. A preacher said something that got to me. And if I can say one thing today, huh, it'll sort of break through that hard-headed outer shell and start to just sort of weave its way into your soul. Well, then so be it. But, I mean, I, I just, when I, when I read these sort of passages, I'm just amazed at what God does for us. God saved me when I didn't even want to be saved. I, I didn't get up that morning and brush my teeth and put on my church clothes. I wasn't even going to church. I wasn't even a church attender. I was like, oh, man, I, you know, get mad, throw something, that's fine. I was like 95% of the Baptists in this country. I got saved, I got slam dunked, and then after two weeks I disappeared. <laughs> I couldn't find me. You couldn't find me. Because once saved, always saved. Y'all want to know what would have happened between 13 and 28 if God decided to take me away from planet Earth? He would have taken me home. And you know where home was for me? Hell. Because I didn't know Jesus. But I made all my friends. I made my youth pastor. I made my parents. I made everybody happy. And they all fell for the, for the trick. But Jesus didn't fall for it. And so he saved me. He can do the same thing for you today. I don't, I don't feel like I'm up in here today preaching to folks in Phoenix, Arizona and had never heard the gospel. I'm preaching to hard-headed folks that won't respond to the gospel. All right? I love you folks. 
but we're so tricked over, over all of the things that are in the church and we don't even know who the one over the church is. So we feel like we can fill our salvation in by attending and by leading. Y'all, I ain't going to heaven because I'm a preacher. I'm going to heaven because God saved me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not going to heaven because you're here today. The only way you can go to heaven is if you believe in Jesus. But the reality is heaven is not something I'm waiting on. Heaven is actually something I can experience in this life right now. It's a condition of life for me now. I'm not waiting to be buried six feet in a hole to see what it feels like to be in heaven. The reality is I can live that life now. And you know how I do that? By serving others, by loving my neighbors, by not trying to figure out what my purpose in life is. I know what my purpose is. It's to go there for and and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I don't have to spend my time endlessly trying to figure out what education I need to get. Do I need to be a nurse? Do I need to be a scientist? Do I need to be Dr. Fauci? Do I need to be Joe Biden? I know I can be Shane in Christ Jesus because he's called me to be who I am. But the reality is my purpose is Jesus Christ. And so many people in the church never get that. I don't know. I just... I'm there, I'm done, I know I've overpreached, but the reality is, I've got some friends here that's going to leave lost, and I don't know who you are, so don't call me and tell me to get mad, I ain't, I ain't picking on you, I ain't picking on nobody, I'm picking on everybody in here that's lost, I want you to get saved, I'm at, you know by now I'm not a revivalist, I'm not, I ain't Charles Finney, I don't read his books, you're welcome to read them, I don't read his books, I'm dull, I'm boring, I'm not emotional enough. I don't preach during the invitation. I never will. I think it's your time with God. If you want to come, you come. But hey, I'm fine with you coming now and saying yes to Jesus. We'll stop the service right now. And if Brother Bob's good with it, we'll fill the baptistry up. I'll slam dunk you right now full on Pentecostal. I ain't scared, but I want you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to leave this building today without knowing that God's calling you to himself. We got all this junk bothering us today. Jesus is the only one not bothering some of us, though. We're so worried about everything but Jesus. It is my prayer that Jesus will hammer you into glory. <laughs> Pray that he will just relentlessly, like the hound of heaven that he is, call you to himself, call you to himself, call you to himself. Thanks be to God that the story didn't end with these Colossians being dead. Because Paul says, God made them alive together with him, incorporation in Christ, our union with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. I could have just said that God brings spiritually dead people to life and I could have shut up and we would have been done by now. But I didn't. And we'll have to deal with that. God breathes the breath of life into dry bones and he gives them life. And the reality of God making us alive, what does that mean? Paul tells us we have been completely forgiven in Christ. Jesus nailed the record of debt that stood against us. Jesus nailed the record of debt that damned us, that proved us guilty beyond any shadow of a doubt to the cross. Therefore, in Christ, our forgiveness is complete, which leads us to the third and final aspect of that completeness, and I know you're happy. In Christ, verse 15, our victory is complete. Quickly, verse 15, if I can turn the page. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Right? 
Make no mistake about it. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ marks the decisive defeat of Satan and his demonic powers. Just as a Roman general would parade his defeated captives through the streets of Rome symbolizing victory, so the cross of Christ stands as a symbol of victory over the rulers and authorities who are currently trying to thwart his redemptive plan. Now, I'm not saying we don't battle against sin today because we do, and our battle is not against flesh and blood but it's against these rulers and authorities but you need to understand that the victory has ultimately been won in the Lord Jesus Christ so as I've said in here before we're not fighting for victory we're fighting from victory it doesn't mean we don't have to fight but we can understand how the end of the story goes we know in the end we win and so the reality is our victory is absolutely complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now to close, I'm sure you're probably at this point wanting to say, you know, oh man, what difference does all this make? And and I like I like to I like to see how Paul sort of sort of has all these sort of same themes throughout most of his letters and and he's always talking about the same thing but in different ways or a lot of times he And so to sort of hammer this home, I want to read Romans 6, 1 through 14. I want to show you how this text really applies to our our lives. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Metaphorical use. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for the dead he died he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to God so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness for sin will have no dominion over over you since you were not under law but under grace so we died with Christ we were buried with Christ we have been resurrected with Christ therefore the old self is gone we're dead to the old way of life which was characterized by constant sin and unrighteousness and now we're alive to a new way of life which is characterized by life and righteousness it's time for Christians in Winston County to start acting like it. I'm going to ask you to stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for allowing me today the opportunity to preach so hard to myself. Uh, It's it's easy for me to be able to see the heart of Paul from Romans chapter 7 when he knows what's right and he still does what's wrong. I wish I I could say I was different than, than Paul in Romans 7, but I'm not. Father, I feel like I have friends in here today, so I'm open to pray in this sanctuary, this safe place, openly and unapologetically to you. 
I know that I oftentimes talk about people living like hell during the week and then living like heaven on Sunday. Perhaps this whole time I've been talking about myself. Sometimes my actions toward my wife and my kids and others who get in my way aren't very Christ-like. And it's amazing at how uh, how quickly my old self can rear its ugly head. And then you give me days like today. You allow me to preach to myself as hard as I've ever preached. And hopefully somebody listened in today on our conversation and they got something. Father, may I, may we, as we move forward toward the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that you're our only audience. (laughs) Father, I pray that uh, you'll be with my friends in here. I I know uh, I'm not sure if I'm speaking to anybody that's currently here right now, but I know that sometimes life can get to a point where it doesn't seem like it's worth living. And then we're able to read Colossians chapter 2. And we're able to see that no matter our problems, no matter our politicians, no matter our football teams, good, bad, ugly, in the grand scheme of things, none of that really matters because we're able to understand that our salvation in Christ is complete. And our forgiveness in Christ is complete. And our victory has already been won through the powerful working of God. Father, I pray that you'll help me to focus on those positive aspects and not the negative ones that tend to drag me down. Father, I pray for my friends in here. Uh, And I, I, I I pray that people will respond. I pray that lives will be changed. Father, I know that no amount of passion or preaching from me or pithy sayings or any sort of opining that I might find myself doing will be of any benefit to anyone if it's void of the Spirit drawing them. So Lord, I pray that you've given us us an opportunity today to at least get into that place where the drawing of of you where the Holy Spirit's wooing of us is more noticeable today than it's ever been Father I love my friends in here I pray that you'll bless them I pray that you'll bless them today with something they haven't even asked for because that's who you are and Father I ask you now to have your way during this time of response I pray that you'll draw people to yourself. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.